In order to determine the value of the charge Q, what we're gonna do is focus our attention on the rightmost charge, and we will draw a free body diagram that shows the forces acting on that charge. That diagram is to the right. We can see the downward gravitational force, which is labeled mg. We know that the charge on the far right is supported by this string right here, and that string is sort of pulling up and to the left on the charge. So we have labeled that force as a tension force right here, and it is acting at a certain angle. We'll explore that in a moment. And then we have this electrostatic force. Now, of course, there will be an electrostatic force because this positive charge is in close proximity to these other two charges. So those other two charges are actually going to create a repulsive force acting on that rightmost charge. Notice it is a repulsive force because these other two charges are positive and so is the charge that we are investigating. So we know that like charges would repel. Now, technically there are two repulsive forces, but for now we have just identified it collectively as a single repulsive electrostatic force. We will resolve that force into two individual forces later on. So this is the basic free body diagram for the rightmost charge. The next thing that we need to figure out, as we will see later, are the distances from the charges here and here to this charge whose free body diagram we have drawn. So we have to figure out those distances. And maybe we can figure out those distances by exploring this right triangle here. We can see that that has an angle labeled theta here. We do know that the length of this string right here is L. And we're gonna to try to figure out this length. For now, we'll just call it X, just an arbitrary label here. And we can see from this diagram that the sine of this angle right here will be the following. We know the sine is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the side that is opposite of this angle is the side labeled X. And then the hypotenuse of our green right triangle is L. Now, if we multiply both sides of this equation by L, that will allow us to cancel the L's on the right-hand side. And then we can see that X is equal to L sine theta. So what we'll do is come back over here and we're gonna label that distance L sine theta. And by a similar line of reasoning, we can conclude that this other distance right here is also equal to L sine theta because of the symmetry of the picture. So those two distances will come in handy later on. But now that we have those distances and we have our free body diagram, the next step is to investigate the forces along the y and x direction. Let's begin with the sum of the forces along the y direction. And before we can really do that effectively, we might take note that this tension force right here needs to be broken up into y and x components. So let's actually draw those components now. We're gonna draw the y component pointing upward. We can label that ty. And then we're gonna label the x component leftward and we can call that Tx. We have another right triangle to explore. It's this one right here. Let's try to come up with an expression for Ty. Looking at that right triangle in yellow, we can see that the cosine of the angle within that right triangle is equal to the adjacent side. Now, ask yourself which side is adjacent to theta, and that would be the Ty. So it's adjacent over hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse would be T. If we multiply both sides of this by t, the t's will cross off on the right side, and that shows us that the y component, ty, is equal to t cosine theta. So when we're doing the sum of the forces in the y direction, we're going to want to look at the forces in the y direction, one of which is the ty, the other of which is mg. But again, ty, we have determined, is equal to t cosine theta. So here we go, notice Ty is pointing upward, so it's going to be positive. We would therefore have positive T cosine of theta. The gravitational force is downward, so that would be minus mg. And those are the only two forces that are acting exclusively in the y direction. And we know that the rightmost charge is in equilibrium. It is suspended, it's just hanging out there, it's not accelerating, so that means the sum of the forces is equal to zero. So that's the expression so far for the y direction. Let's turn over and look at the x direction next. The sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to. Now we're gonna to have to come up with an expression for Tx as well. So that's our next step. We can use some right triangle trigonometry again. We can see from that right triangle that the sine of theta 
equals the opposite side, which is Tx. Notice Tx is opposite of this angle, over the hypotenuse, which again is T. Same idea, multiply both sides by T, they cross out. You can see that Tx is equal to T sine theta. Okay, so let's look at the forces acting exclusively in the x direction. That would be this force here, as well as that electrostatic force. Notice the electrostatic force is pointing to the right, so it will be positive. We would therefore have positive Fe minus Tx, and remember, Tx is equal to T sine of theta. So we'll say minus T sine of theta. And then again, it's in equilibrium, so we're gonna set this equal to zero. So far, so good. Now we have to do some algebraic manipulation here. Why don't we make some room? Because what we're gonna do is actually solve the second equation for Fe. So we're gonna add T sine theta to both sides of this equation. And by doing that, we can see that Fe is equal to T sine of theta, so that's gonna be helpful. Let's also come over here and solve this equation for T cos theta. So we're gonna add mg to both sides. And so now if we can squeeze this in here, we see that T cosine of theta is equal to mg. Okay, so it might not be clear where we're going with this yet, but I think what we'll have to do is probably still go with this equation and solve for T. We're gonna to need to make some more room to do that. So we're gonna solve that equation for T. The best way is to divide both sides by cosine of theta. So we'll divide both sides by cosine of theta. Those will cancel out. Now we have T is equal to mg over cosine of theta. And I think what's nice about that is that this expression for T can be substituted right there into our other equation. So that's what we're gonna do is make a little substitution. Let's do this carefully. So the T is gonna be replaced with mg over cosine of theta. And then this is still multiplied by sine of theta. And now we have a little mathematical here because we have sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. And we hopefully know that that's equivalent to tangent of theta. So we now have the electrostatic force equaling mg times the tangent of theta. And that's gonna be useful to us because we know the mass, we know g, and we know the angle as well. But what we still need to do is introduce the charge. Remember, the whole goal here was to figure out the charge. So let's go back to the diagram. And at this point, we wanna talk about the two electrostatic forces that are acting on this positive charge. Remember, we earlier said that there are two of them. There's one from the middle charge pushing this to the right, and then there's another force from the left charge pushing to the right as well. Notice the force from the left charge is gonna be smaller because the left charge is farther away from the right charge. We have learned in this chapter that the basic expression for an electrostatic force is equal to K multiplied by the magnitude of the first charge times the magnitude of the second charge divided by a distance squared. Now, let's consider this pair of charges right here, which will create that electrostatic force. So again, the middle charge is repelling the rightmost charge, and it's that force right there. And so we're gonna use this equation to represent that. And we might say for now that this will be Fe, and we'll just use a subscript of M to represent the middle charge because we're looking at the force that the middle charge exerts on the rightmost charge. So we would have K multiplied by Q, notice the charge on the middle is Q, and then multiplied by another Q because the rightmost charge also has a charge of Q, and then divided by the distance between them squared. Now we found that distance earlier, remember, that was L sine theta. So we're gonna put L sine theta, but then don't forget to square it. So that's the electrostatic force exerted by the middle charge on the rightmost charge. So that's this force right here. That's what we had called Fm, which we might label here. But then the other electrostatic force, which we might call Fl, is going to be exerted by the leftmost charge. So the leftmost charge will exert an electrostatic force on the rightmost charge. We've called that F2. Let's set up, or Fl, excuse me, let's set up an expression for Fl. So it's gonna be K times Q times Q again, because the left and the right charges have a charge of Q. But be careful here with the distance. The total distance from the leftmost charge to the rightmost charge is L sine of theta plus another L sine of theta. So that would be two L sine of theta. So we're gonna put that in here. 
This is a lovely little question. Okay, so together these form the total electrostatic force. Remember, we said the total electrostatic force is composed of both of those two individual electrostatic forces. So when we have our equation with Fe in it right here, what we're going to do is substitute this force plus, whoa, look at that, that force right there, because together they each make up the electrostatic force. So let's add this and this to represent this force right here. And there we have it, the total electrostatic force is the sum of those two individual electrostatic forces. Let's begin to clean each one of them up. So for the first one right here, we're going to have K times Q squared divided by, let's see, this becomes L squared sine squared of theta. And then here we have another KQ squared, but then this denominator is, now be careful, you have to square everything here. So square the two to make it into a four, and then square the L and then square sine. So it looks like that. At some point, we're gonna to try to solve this expression for the charge Q. But before we can do that, we need to establish a common denominator on the left side so that we can add the fractions together. That means we'd have to multiply this bottom by four and this top by four, because then we have a nice common denominator right there. Once the denominator on the bottom is common, then we can add the numerators. So four KQ squared plus one KQ squared is five KQ squared and then place that over your common denominator of 4L squared sine squared of theta. We're getting very close here. This is equal to mg tangent of theta. Remember, your goal is to solve for Q. So to solve for Q here, we could probably just multiply both sides by 4L squared sine squared of theta. Let's see, yeah, 4L squared sine squared of theta. These will cancel out right here. So now we have 5KQ squared is equal to this sort of blob right here. We'll just copy paste. Solving for Q, we'll divide both sides by 5K. That'll cancel it out on the left-hand side. So now we have the right side divided by 5K. And then finally, we'll take the square root of both sides. So Q is equal to the square root of this monstrosity right here. And there is our final expression for Q. We'd probably simplify this further, but this is good enough for now. We're going to plug in all the known values. So we should go back and retrieve m, theta, l, and then k is a constant, and so is little g. So we'll plug those in right now. There are all the known values plugged in. Take note, please, that l, I believe, was given as 30 centimeters. So you have to divide that by 100 to get it into meters. So that would become 0.30 meters. Also, when you type sine squared of 45, I see some students have trouble with that. You just do sine of 45 on your calculator and then square that result like so. I think that takes care of all the issues. Make sure your calculator, of course, is set to degree mode because our angle here is measured in degrees. And we can see when we punch this in very carefully that our charge is 1.98 times 10 to the minus 6. And the standard unit of charge is coulombs. If you need to convert that into microcoulombs, just recall that 1 microcoulomb is 10 to the negative 6th coulombs. So if you multiply by that conversion factor, the coulombs would cancel out. And you're basically divided by 10 to the negative 6, which will give you a microcoulomb charge of 1.98. So 1.98 microcoulombs would work, but so would 1.98 times 10 to the negative 6th coulombs. So either one of those would be correct. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I would greatly appreciate it. But if not, no worries. I appreciate you taking the time regardless to watch.